Are you well? Yes. Are you... Oh, God. This is not a good start, because I was about to ask if you were wet. <laughs> I'm so sorry to all of you. Did anyone get rained on? A few of you. Thank you still for turning out. We have a sold-out crowd. That is an absolute delight. Um, I am your host for the evening. My name is Lewis Buxton. And uh, by a show of hands, who has been to Toast before? Excellent audience retention. Thank you, Arts Council England. Um, who is new to Toast this, this night? And we're still engaging new audiences. Absolutely smashing it. Okay, so for those who have never been to Toast before, um, usually we have uh, two headliners. But... This month, you are very lucky because you are getting three headliners, two floor spots, and one very excited host. I'm very aware that I sort of have the energy of like, um, like a Eurovision host who's on cocaine and lost their auto cue, and Heath Ledger in 10 Things I Hate About You singing I Love You Baby down the steps of a sports field. I'm aware that's a vibe. Um, but yeah, um, I'm going to kick us off with a poem. And I genuinely believe, thank you. <laughs> Just one person whooping poetry at a night that has explicitly said it is a poetry night. Hands up if you've never been to a poetry night before. A few of you? Cool, wicked, thanks for coming. Um, lovely, that's lovely. Um, so, uh, hands up if you are in a couple or thruple or polyamorous situation, that's cool too. It's Norwich, mate. It's becoming one big sperm bank. <laughs> um, uh, there's, a, there's a couple like there at the back uh, next to the pillar. Hello. Um, what, what's your name? Yeah. Simon. And uh, what's your partner's name? Simon and Anne. Lovely to meet you. Um, you are almost definitely the most hetero couple here, so well done. Um, <laughs> did you guys... Um, I don't know. I don't know your life. That's not fair of me at all. Um... Uh, did you guys do Valentine's Day in a big way? No. Wicked. No! <laughs> she sat there being like, I took you to the zoo. <laughs> I took you to the monkey you loved. Um, no, I don't, I, we, we don't really do Valentine's either. Um, but I got commissioned this year. When you're a poet, like, it's, it's odd, like, being a poet, people, um, you always end up at, like, dinner parties with, like, city boys who sound a lot like me, but hopefully don't, like act quite like I do and they always sort of say they're always called like Tristan or Tyrion or some other Game of Thrones shit and um, they always say stuff like so there's, uh, there's not much money in poetry is there to which you can only really respond well there's not much poetry in money but they don't they don't like that that's not their favorite thing um, but yeah so like one of the ways you make money as a poet is um, you you uh, write commissions. So I got commissioned by um, the Norfolk Museum Service uh, to write a poem about medieval love for Valentine's Day. And they showed me these, uh, these wax seals in their museum. Go and check out the Museum of Norwich. It's, it's, it's really cool. There's like medieval stuff, suits of armor, and then just arbitrarily a stuffed tiger. Um, and there, so there's wa this wax seal, and on it, it's, it's the thing that you'd like imprint on like a love letter and seal it with wax. Um, and on it, it said... I am the flower of love. I was like, well, that's wanky. <laughs> um, it was not as bad. There was another one that was um, uh, woman of disloyalty. I sort of love that as an idea for like Tinder profiles going forward. <laughs> Helen Norwich, 25, woman of disloyalty. <laughs> but I am the flower of love. Now, um, all the poets that you'll see tonight are not only phenomenal poets, they are also uh, incredible educators. Almost all of them run workshops or work with people, young and old, uh, to engage them in poetry in new and exciting ways. And one of the things that you'll always hear in a poetry workshop is to include concrete detail, right? The more abstract a thing is, the more it sort of floats away. It's, and, and concrete details, they, they anchor words to a page, right? So, I am the flower of love is about as fucking abstract as you can get. So, and I, and so like, if somebody re read that to me in, like a, in a workshop, I'd be like, oh, rather than saying, like, I am the flower of love, say, I am the Forsythia of fancying you a bit. <laughs> I am the Dahlia of, damn, girl, are you a parking ticket? Because you've got fine written all over you. 
I am the poppy of pushing you down in the playground, pulling your pigtails. I am a red and cruel thing that sometimes stops you feeling any pain. I am the amaryllis of a moor. I am the orchid of awkward office romance. Two seeds planted at their desks, flourished by the water cooler, drinking in the light of cubicle lamps. I am the sunflower of snogging in a side street. Snogging's a fucking awful word, isn't it? I am the sunflower of snogging in a side street. I'm the hydrangea of that Harry met Sally. Strangers in the night, friends forever. When are you guys going to get together? Vibe. I am the rhododendron of role play, keeping the spark alive. I am the forget-me-not of all first and future dates. I am the daffodil of do not fuck this up. I am the marigold of shotgun marriages. I'm the cornflower of teenage street corner crushes. I am the snowdrop of secondary school kisses. I am the snapdragon of sixth form infatuation. I am the Asinia of university obsession. I had to look up Asinia up. I am the hollyhock of lockdown summertime lust. I am the heliotrope of hearts always turning toward the sun. I am the begonia of birthday presents. The amaryllis of all our anniversaries. The violet of oh fuck. It's Valentine's tomorrow and I've not got you any flowers yet. Well done for reacting to a poem. I always think poems are a lot like farts and that one happens in a room and nobody knows whether to acknowledge it or not. But audiences also like farts. I don't trust the silent ones. So give us all your love. Um, Simon and Anne, would you mind being, um, I'm going to give you a roll for the night if it's okay. Don't worry, you don't have to do anything more. You don't have to speak. It's going to be fine. All you have to do is clap. Are you happy with that? Are you happy with me giving you the clap? <laughs> Go on, Si. Um, uh, so yeah, when I bring up a poet, I just want you to be a sort of like our audience artist of the night. Being an audience is as much an artistic thing as being up on this stage in that no one will appreciate you until you're gone. Um, and so, so when I bring up a poet, I just want you to go absolutely wild and let that spread out, let that clap spread around. Um, so, first up, uh, we have a poet whose work I first found on a thing called um, uh, the internet. And um, there's so much bollocks and scary stuff on the internet. And then when I came across Perla's work, it's like having a little like, Instagram window into like a glorious other life. A life that is like, full of hardship, but love too. And I'm so excited for you to meet her. So ladies and gentlemen, starting with Simon and Anne, I want you to put your hands together for Perla Cantagia! Okay, Lewis, it's hard to top that stamina, but I mean, I'm gonna try. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the poem I'm gonna, I'm gonna read today, I penned down like two weeks ago to be exact. And before I start reading, I just wanna say a very cliche expression. It's an honor to be here for reasons that are quite obvious. And uh, yeah. So the poem is called Liz Tells Me, Only Fans Pays in USD. Damn, this paper is noisy. You bake banana bread whenever you're pissed. The morning you come back from Beirut, Liz swings by, says, damn, somebody's all frisky today. The kitchen smells fucking good. She has no idea. Makes you guess what she was up to during Christmas break. Exploring your sexuality, I cannot but guess. Sort of, she says, more like monetizing it, lol. So, <laughs> so how was your vacay? You light a cigarette until the yeast eats the sugar. You don't wonder what her username is. In another sphere, you know what yours could be. Belladonna of the Mideast slash vibe kill. A siren with anxiety. You go to the store. A group of climate change protesters pass by you with slogans. This is the greatest threat to our existence. You get the essential. Take the bus home. Over here, small talk, 14-year-olds discussing condoms, colleagues making plans to jog. You check how much this ride would cost in liras today. You scroll. Breaking, Lebanon's lira hits low of 30,000 to a dollar amid severe crisis. 
You are atrophied into guilt for not walking. Scroll. Breaking. Beirut port blast. Investigation suspended for fourth time. Five pounds. Five pounds today is 203,000 liras. Breaking. Lebanon grapples with drastic electricity shortages and internet cuts. Five pounds. Two bags of bread, kilos of lemons and eggplants and apples. Scroll. Breaking. UN says at least one million children in danger of violence as crisis intensifies in Lebanon. Five pounds. A sachet of Tylenol. Lexotania, half a gram of weed. You stop scrolling, breaking. In your tote bag, discounted valerian root capsules sit with their stress-relieving properties. Anyone flying to Beirut soon? You tweet, secure the transport of the gift. But no one's going back. You return to the kitchen, knead your rage into the ready dough. There are hungry animals everywhere. Thank you. Perla Kansagian! Thank you so much. Um, our first headliner of the night is so, uh, I think it's uh, like, I'm gonna be wanky and quote someone, but like, I think John, it might've been John Betjeman who said that um, most people aren't interested in poetry because most poetry isn't interested in most people, right? So firstly, I feel like we've disproved him tonight. Thank you very much. Um, but secondly, I think that, that there, there's an element of truth to that. There's a lot of poems out there that have no interest in you or me. Right? They have no interest in, in our everyday lives. They're interested in a, different, in a different kind of life. And that's fine, that's cool, that's whatever. Kate Fox's poems pay attention to people. They are interested in people. They engage with them with love, sadness, complexity. And I've seen Kate perform in front of like 300 year nine girls, and I'm so excited for you to be as wonderful an audience as they were. So, starting with Simon and Anne, we're gonna welcome the author of a new book, The Oscillations, Kate Fox! Oh, that was a good intro. Thank you, Lewis. Hello, everyone. Okay, so first of all, I have to explain my voice, which basically, I think, so it's not COVID, first of all. Basically, my, my boyfriend did, this is too much information. Um, my boyfriend did have COVID. I didn't get the COVID, but then he got a cold. I said, that can't be a cold. That's just the remains of your COVID, even though you're now testing negative. And then I got his cold. So it was an actual cold. Anyway, um, <laughs> Serves me right. Um, so, in fact, here is a poem kind of about that. Um, a very recent poem. <clears throat> I snogged a man with COVID. <laughs> we didn't know it at the time. We'd been meeting freely. Now our love was no longer a crime. But news of his daughter's positive lateral flow came through after I made him a cup of tea. Luckily, the window happened to be open because I'd just febrezed the settee. <laughs> True story and brilliant opportunity to use the word febreze in a poem. Um, perhaps I should have let him stay. It was so lovely to have our date. But I knew the earlier kiss of possible COVID meant I'd have to self-isolate. I didn't get it in the end whilst he tested positive the next day. I left some groceries on his doorstep and stayed out of everyone's way. I snogged a man with COVID, our pandemic relationship's latest hurdle. Though while Omicron inflamed his brain, I finally beat him at Wordle. Thank <laughs> you. 
actual true story. Like, I got three, and he got five the first day, tested positive. Um, oh, I should check the time. I had no idea. Okay. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So I came on about uh, 7.47, so I will get off at seven minutes past eight. Okay. Right. Um, so um, this is... Um, one of the poems that's um, in my new book, The Oscillations, I was just finishing um, the book and the poems for it as the first lockdown came into force and I couldn't not write about what was happening, even though that had not at all been my intention. Um, I'm, I am quite hyper-vigilant, I suppose, about breathing, respiratory illnesses, um, because my um, my dad had died of emphysema. There's a lot of it in our family. Um, I've um, long been, or I was a radio reporter in the northeast of England, and there's a lot of mesothelioma and other kind of industrial respiratory diseases. My PhD supervisor actually died of mesothelioma as well. Um, and I, there were just all these intersections of, of breathing. Um, so... This is just called Breathe. One, two, three. Be mindful, they say. If your epithelial cells are under attack, just breathe. You can be whoever you want to be, they say. Despite the death of industry, expel the coal and metal dust from your lungs, just breathe. We are all equal, we are all free, they say. Even with a knee on your neck, just breathe. The sea and the trees unclogged in that pause, open to the sky to just breathe, breathe, breathe. Thank you. Like, fair play, that was probably improved by my dodgy voice, wasn't it? In a way, <laughs> like, results. Um, okay. Um, so, um, I'm currently, um, well, sort of, sort of currently, have been um, doing a show, touring a show about Doctor Who um, and autism um, and neurodiversity generally, because... Um, I'm autistic and to me it's always self-evident that the doctor in Doctor Who is autistic but I forget it's not self-evident to everyone and I kind of have to explain that um, and this poem um, or maybe autistic and ADHD or, or something like that anyway um, so this poem was in my set many years before I had that diagnosis um, and it comes from a line that Christopher Eccleston's doctor said to Billy Piper's Rose in the first episode of the first series of the new Doctor Who and she said to him, how come, if you're an alien, you've got a northern accent? <laughs> Fair point, isn't it? And he replied, lots of planets have a north. <laughs> and <laughs> Yes, and I felt like this statement of relativity um, said something that I needed to say too. So this contains um, more information about me than you'd ever need to know as well. So... Lots of planets have a north. Normal is somewhere I have never been. You need a home to be an alien. Sometimes averages are just mean. I read Jane Eyre when I was seven. Moved on to Geoffrey Archer novels by the time I was 11. Never rebelled with drink or drugs, just Salvador Dali posters and ethnic rugs. Lots of planets... <laughs> have a north, normally somewhere I have never been, you need a home to be an alien, sometimes averages are just mean, I know I've got a distinctive voice, sometimes you just think it's cruel the way the word lisp has got an S in it, in a similar way to how it's cruel the word dyslexia is difficult to spell. I have two webbed toes, my eye lenses are rugby ball shaped when they should be round, I score highly on the autistic spectrum, which I'm aware sounds like an 80s computer that refuses to network with other computers. <laughs> Lots of planets have a north. Normally somewhere I have never been. You need a home to be an alien. Sometimes averages are just mean. I'm learning to play the ukulele. My relationship role model is Coronation Street's Roy and Haley. I've never had a one-night stand or even a one-night snog. I prefer to swallow rather than spit, because then it saves wondering what to do with it. 
Ooh, ooh. Quite a big reaction to that line, Norwich. Almost rivaling Wakefield's reaction. Like, weirdly, Wakefield loved that line. <laughs> To the point where it was like, should their tagline as a city be, we love to swallow? Anyway, um, okay. <laughs> lots of planets have a north. Maybe some of them will hear this verse. Because every earthling is an alien to some other species somewhere in the universe. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one of the things that really got me through the lockdowns um, was swimming in the sea, um, and I, I refuse to call it um, wild swimming, you'll notice it's just a swimming outside, um, and I'd already been doing it for a few summers, but I sh I'm trying to do that thing, aren't I? Yes, I was already doing it before it was very popular, but I was, uh, and uh, <laughs> it didn't get me through. Um, but I also love swimming in pools, um, but there is something about um, swimming pools that I've noticed. The pool I used to go in um, a lot where I, when I used to live in um, Thirsk in North Yorkshire, there were always, whenever I went, two women doing breaststroke while talking to each other. And then I realised they weren't just in Thirsk pool. They, they were basically in every swimming pool. Maybe some of you are those women. Um, so this is dedicated to them. <clears throat> there are two women swimming breaststroke in the pool, ploughing slowly, firmly, up and down. There are two women talking as they swim in every pool, in every town. They will not rush, they will not push, they're immersed in what they have to say, these two women with their heads above the water, sailing on in their stately way. There's always two women swimming breaststroke in the pool. They're not afraid to breathe and take up space. These two women with their heads above the water bend the rest of us to their glacial pace. No one can pass the two women in the pool. A tidal barrier clocking up the lengths and miles. Woman spreading across the lanes. Low voices echoing off the tiles. There's two women swimming breaststroke in the pool. They give me pause. They slow me down. But sometimes when I'm behind the two women in the pool, I really wish they'd fucking drown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's my most feminist poem, to be honest. <laughs> well, um, I suppose it's a bit confusing the word feminist at, at the moment. Is it, I, I mean, as a working class person, feminist is obviously quite. A bit, but anyway, basically, if you if you introduce yourself and you say that you're a feminist and a poet, a feminist poet. I do think the two words become mutually off-putting in a way. <laughs> a bit like Christian and musician. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like hard balance, hard balance to strike. Anyway, we crack on. Um, so, how am I doing? Uh, eight minutes, okay. Because this part of the thing of doing the live performance, that is part of the skill, you kind of have to, unless you really plan in advance exactly what you're going to do, which I don't, I had a broad idea. You kind of have to work backwards on the timing. So I'm now trying in my head to work out what eight minutes is. But I, yeah, okay, we could do it, we're doing it. Okay, so this is another poem from the Oscillations. And it's kind of about how, um, well, I, so bookshops are so important um, to me, as I imagine they are to lots of you. And when I realised the lockdown was coming, the last shop I went to was a bookshop. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, and then, well, the poem says it, so I don't need to say it, but it, it, was, it was so important to be able to go back to them again. So this is called Returns. <coughs> The plague books won't be in yet, but the dystopia section will be well stocked, and you'd usually want two metres of space to browse anyway. This last shop I came to on purpose, a pilgrimage, 
Then, the assistant said, they still had customers. Her son had been sent home for coughing in PE. So there's where I'll return first. Enjoy the full shelves, calming lines, the glossy wooden lectern, the smell of new, the rash of woodcut covers in striking monochromes, the imprints from London, Chicago, New York. I spent £50 I no longer had last time. We'll spend another 50 next. Feeling and preserving an ecology, a sort of home. So happy for this normality, my eyes will fill so the titles are blurred. But reading, reading, no, can hardly take in a word. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else had that experience but I knew quite a few people who like me in early lockdown certainly suddenly couldn't read and that was the thing I always did to escape and then my concentration had just gone and it's been really interesting to talk to people where it's like varyingly come back at certain points in fact weirdly mine came back with a Joanna Trollope novel, which wouldn't normally have been a thing, but it was like my gentle way. Anyway, um, oh, the voice is it? Well, okay. it's going to hold out for at least two more, so we'll do that. Um, so, um, festivals. Festivals are a thing I used to do quite a lot of, um, and I was once... I was once poet in residence for the Glastonbury Festival, um, which actually, for me, was... I don't really like big crowds or camping, um, so it wasn't... And it was the year the Rolling Stones were headlining. Don't really like the Rolling Stones. <laughs> but apart from that, it was the ideal gig. Um, no, um, <coughs> so there was this surreal moment. Like, basically, I had to be there from the Wednesday to the Sunday, do two poems each day that got uploaded to the website... And they asked me on the Saturday morning, would I go and be interviewed by John Humphreys of the Today programme in his radio car? And I was like, oh, OK. And apparently it was his first visit to the festival. And um, so I went and sat in the radio car. Now, this was the Saturday. I'd not had a shower since I got there from the Wednesday. I was waiting till the Rolling Stones were going to be on on the Saturday night and I was going to have a shower when everyone else was there, which did work out brilliantly. I had an empty shower, but it means that on the Saturday morning, John Humphreys would just have been like, mm, I remember that smelly northern poet. Anyway, um, so I'm sat next to him. And he waxes lyrical to my surprise about the festival. He's like, oh, you can just feel the special atmosphere. It's kind of almost, yeah, you can just feel it around you. And I was like, has someone slipped drugs in his tea? And then he said he'd heard Mick Jagger was coming later and he was going to be staying in a yoghurt. Um, and his producer gently corrected him. He was like, I think you mean a yurt. He was like, oh, a yurt, yeah. Um, and then that made me imagine for my next poem of the day, what would Mick Jagger's yurt have been like? So maybe this. He can watch glass door on a plasma telly. There's steam in showers if things get smelly and not a single speck of dirt in Mick Jagger's yurt. There's a chef, a pool, a helipad, a jester on hand if he gets sad and supermodels fight to flirt in Mick Jagger's yurt. A jumper's woven from his personal sheep. A string quartet lulls him to sleep. The security guards are never curt in Mick Jagger's yurt. There's a diamond studded ceiling, a dodo feather quilt, a secret tunnel to Martinique has been especially built. Noble gases remain inert in Mick Jagger's <laughs> yurt. A five, no, a six G signals pumped in by hand. The air so pure, your lungs expand. Mm, Keith Richards' lumbago doesn't hurt in Mick <laughs> Jagger's yurt. It's not ordinary life he's trying to dodge. It's just Glastonbury's not got a travel lodge. And even Bono would sell his shirt to stay in Mick Jagger's yurt. Thank you. <laughs> And I'm not saying that radio listeners are pedantic, but originally the line about noble gases was noble gases become inert, but someone pointed out that they're always already inert. So I had to change it. Anyway, right. Um, so 
Right, the voice has held out, that is good. Um, you have amazing treats coming up. Um, I've not um, yet seen our middle headliner, RG, but he sounds amazing. And Joelle Taylor is only like basically the most amazing poet working in the country at the moment, full stop. So, um, so this is good. Um, so, right. Um, okay, so I'm going to end with this. Um, <coughs> It's just take quite a lot of breath. Right, okay. Um, I've been poet in residence for the, the Great North Run up in, in Newcastle um, back in 2011. And then they asked me to do a 40th anniversary poem that kind of reflected how things had been over the last couple of years because they managed to, to run the run last year. And so this is called This Run Is For You. Yeah. Okay. The doorstep clappers, the calm, the flappers, the delivery drivers, the solitude thrivers, the banana bread bakers, the sourdough makers, those who kept their distance and those who went too far, those who built some Lego, their strength relationships a bar. Those who saw their whole lives collapse, those who healed, those relapsed. This run, this run is for you. The handholders, doctors, nurses, indefatigable carers, the new dog owners, the lost aloners, the social media sharers, the toilet roll hoarders, the new wild swimmers and paddle boarders, the first time zoomers, the euron muters, the repairers of bodies and computers, the unsung NHS and supermarket staff, the ones who said you've got to laugh, the ones who thought it was like flu, the ones who did not make it through. This run, this run is for you. The folks who built cairns on Whitley Bay Beach, those who travelled deserted streets to teach, the shouters at the daily briefing, those who let their sadness out, those who kept their grief in, the food bank givers and receivers, the conspiracy theorists, the news believers. The box set bingers, the stoics, the whingers, the DIY dyers, the self-cutting fringers. This run, this run is for you. The ventilated, medicated, vaccinated, the pickers and the packers, the ushers, marshals, cue makers, undertakers, volunteer jabbers. The radio voices who kept us going through the endless night. My 84-year-old stepmom, Rosemary, who went when the time was right. My 44-year-old friend, Lisa, who was taken far too soon. Those who stared at quiet roads, their love, their phone, the moon. The pebble painters, rainbow displayers. The daily walkers, animal crossing players. The homeschoolers with all those endless worksheets. Those emulating Captain Tom's endurance feats. The pavement cyclists, the huffing joggers. The involuntarily celibate the illicit snoggers, the rule benders, the rule keepers, the weird dreamers, the restless sleepers, the I'm just holding in, the screamers, the stuck, the shielding, the quarantiners, those who knew that this would pass, those who felt it was forever, those miles, those... those miles, those endless miles, we, we got through them together. This one, this one is for you. Thank you. We do believe you, Kate, don't worry. Ladies and gentlemen, Kate Fox. You mentioned uh, conspiracy theorists in that last poem. And the thing I love about conspiracy theorists 
and it is just one thing. Um, <laughs> Is the, especially when they self-identify as conspiracy theorists, they say, I am a conspiracy theorist. Does anybody know the right root of the word conspire? It means to breathe together. There's some painful irony to that, isn't there? Um, anyway, um, so I'm super excited for our next headliner. Um, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a bit of a dick and... and um, uh, and, and quote some stuff, because I think that's, that's sometimes, again, like, I try really hard to think about how to introduce people, um, but ultimately, I, I, I just, I don't have the proper words. Um, and uh, so, like, there's, I think Dylan Thomas says this thing. Um, he says, a poem is when an emotion has found its thought, and a thought has found its word. R.G. Manuel Pillay is a poet, and a rapper, and a storyteller, and it is as if he sort of grouped all my emotions and gone, this is what you think about them. And then he's gone a step beyond that, and he's gone, and this is how best to articulate it. <laughs> and it makes me so happy inside. His first pamphlet came out with Outspoken Press, who our final headliner is an editor of, and then his second collection, his first full debut collection, Improvised Explosive Device, is going to be coming out with Pend in the Margins later this year. I am so excited for it. Simon, Anne, you are so excited for it. <laughs> so let's start that clap going over there, and then I'm going to bring on the one and only R.G. Manuel Pillay! Thank you so much, and big round of applause for Kate Fox for getting through that. <clears throat> I was losing my throat just while listening to it. Um, yeah, I um, sorry about having to go to the toilet during that one. I don't know what I was more scared about, being on stage or having to piss myself in front of everybody. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here and to share the stage with such brilliant people. Um, it's been a hell of a day going through Shenfield and being here, but you know what? <laughs> Shout out to Shenfield. Um, it's been um, brilliant all the same. And there was well, replacement buses, which actually got us here, so that's brilliant. Uh, this is called Monkey, dedicated to this wonderful gentleman in Wigan who called me Monkey. Look at me, eh? Flying through the window so the whole pub screams. Smashing the bottles off the back of the bar. Scattering pork scratchings on your good old days. Look at me, eh? Dead staring that small child while I yank off the dartboard. Frisbee at the wise crack just out the toilet. Climbing the walls and sliding my red balls up and down the length of the TV so everyone could see these scarlet ass cheeks. So the pixelated Harry Kane will make that fingers on plague sound. <laughs> Look at me, bowling pool balls at old folks with older jokes about onion barges. Spearing the pool stick into your bulldog's butt. No, I will not keep calm and carry on. I'll rip the flag from the wall, swing circles on the chandelier, mane in wind, voice echoing with that joyful mantra of brown boys in the countryside. Thank you. Joel said, like, I'll oh, get us some seats in the place. I was like, cool. Next thing I know, we were right in the middle of here. And only now I'm looking around and seeing such beautiful, beautiful faces. Welcome, everybody, as we bring words alive. I feel like this is such an amazingly dramatic and theatrical space. And so it's an absolute pleasure to share poems in it. Um, I won an award um, for... I didn't win it, actually. I just lied there completely. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was shortlisted for it. And it, <laughs> it was the T.S. Eliot. I won the T.S. <laughs> no, no, no. I was shortlisted. These days, <laughs> these days, nobody's heard of the awards, so you can say what you want. I suddenly realized if you don't get into a magazine, you know, people are always like, I'm trying to get in that magazine. I'm trying to get in that magazine. I'm just pretend. Just pretend. <laughs> Only about 20 people read the magazine. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, 
Uh, so I was nominated for a prize. It was a BAME prize, okay? And obviously I entered, so I'm, I'm happy to jump on the bandwagon while I'm entering. Uh, but <laughs> when I have to tell other people about it, then I feel a bit embarrassed to say BAME because I'm like, uh, I don't know, it's kind of like a weird thing. I wouldn't say I'm against it, but I wouldn't say I love being a part of it as well because it's like winning an award in a minority, within a minority, you know, it's a bit strange. So I wrote this poem about it. It's called, Nominated for a BAME Prize. It's always in capitals, like someone is shouting it, like the bus beeping to let the disabled ramp down. I'm at an awards ceremony. There's BAME waitresses, toilet attendants, caterers, and us, like the lead parts in Coming to America, Sari, shalwar, hijab, turban, so many BAME outfits, I feel almost un-BAME in my m and shirt and trousers. <laughs> this isn't from m and incidentally. <laughs> I'm stuffed for photos with canapes, meat on stick, marveling at the ceiling. Tomorrow when I meet my family, I shall tell them I was loved, revered by many. I will say I drank responsibly. Thank you. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> yeah, anyway, it, it's not like I'm against BAME prizes. I mean, if you want to give me one, I'm more than happy to take it. <laughs> um, I've, got, I've got this poem here. So sometimes poems can be uh, things that we all nod and just say, yeah, I agree with that. But other times, we all might not nod, okay? And this is one of those poems, it's like prov provocative, yeah? So don't take offense if you are white people. <laughs> Every sort of white people, pinkers, grapefruit, pinking, string clothes, sizzling bacon, sausage strips glistening on the grill, white people, dead on their deck chairs, cocktails and nachos, etch a sketch tattoos, texting, wish you were here, wonderfully wistful white people, bee-eyed, pre-tanned, sun creaming their screaming four-year-old, thumb in a Catherine Cookson classic t-shirt saying, I went to Tenerife and all I got was white people, <laughs> bouncing, bulges, kebabby, chip, Fat frothing from panty line, twitching buttocks, rabbits with nightmares. Oh, wonderfully white people return to work, smiling coyly, flashing your skin like a fine new coat. Thank you. Great. Um, well, what we're going to do now is I, I also like to rap sometimes, um, and I'm going to do that now. Uh, that was a good way of introducing it, I think. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, freestyle, right? And the thing about freestyle is sometimes freestyle can be really good, and it can be like, wow, everyone's like, wow, that's really good. And I go to schools, and I've been to other places doing freestyle, but sometimes it can plummet and die. And uh, even though people don't go, wow, that's really good, they still are entertained by someone crashing and burning. That's what I love about it. Even when it's tripping and falling, it's like a guitarist dropping his pick inside the guitar. You know, and having to shake it like that. There's something entertaining about it. So um, I've got my DJ up there. He's just c came on. Uh, he didn't have a DJ name. Does anyone have a good DJ name for my DJ up there? Okay, DJ Silence, run the track. Oh no, wait, 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 DJ Silence, wait. We're good. To prove that it's freestyle, we're gonna take three words from the audience. One from this side, one from the middle, and one from that side. So have a think and shout out a word. Anybody got a word? Bread. Bread, okay, great, thanks. He had it on the mind, he's had carbs on the mind. He hasn't had his carb intake. Bread, brilliant, thank you very much. And in the middle, in the middle, any words? Thank you very much. It's always one, isn't there? <laughs> it's always one. Uh, and over here. Shenfield. Sh Shenfield, okay, yeah, great. Shenfield bread and cantankerous. I can hardly say it, let alone rabbit. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can turn it up a little bit. That'd be brilliant.
Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that really was going really fast. I didn't know what happened. It felt like it was going really, really quickly past me, like a speeding train. Sometimes the uh, words fall really delicately, and that was like 100 miles an hour. I've got a new book coming out. Um, I think I'm doing all right for time. It's one of those things. Yeah, brilliant. I have got a new book uh, coming out. Um, I don't know why I put the mic stand right in front of me there. That was strange, eh? And um, it's with Pending the Margins. It's a great honor to do that and to um, bring that out. Uh, in the journey of making that book, I had the opportunity to research it and interview different people. And I was really interested in specifically extremism, right? And extremism that pushes us uh, from one side of a spectrum to the other. So I looked at, uh, I interviewed... EDL members, National Front members, but also uh, far left people, people who had lost their kids to ISIS, um, and people who had really been pushed and affected by extremism. Uh, and then I've created the entire book uh, around that idea, which really sort of revolved a lot about violence and our relationship to violence. Um, moods sort of come down a little bit there, innit? <laughs> um, but I was inspired by a lot of the people I met. And actually, when you get a big mob of people, people can be really scary. Uh, but when you get one-on-one -on -one with people, there's very few that I struggle to connect with or understand. And a lot of the people were just, you know, lonely, uh, not much going on, struggling. And those are things that we can all share in. So I'm a true believer in the power of conversation. Um, this is called I Love You, Ma'am. There is always so much violence when we are together because there is so much togetherness after the violence. In the pink of victory, our wounds make eyes in the dark. Eyes find podiums in our mouths. Scars write bios on our bodies. Look at him lick the laughter from my cuts. Tales of anthems belted out in the somber streets of 3 a.m. A snap at a bollard, 
A woman runs scared, a curtain snatched, a bus stop shrapnel. There is so much hope in togetherness, in stringing voices up, swinging fists high enough to punch the moon from the sky. We smoke on a stoop on the slabs of my dad's old market stall. He wants to thank me for kicking that kid so hard he didn't kick back, but settles for calling me a crazy fucker. It's nothing, I say. I love you like the weight of my boot in the face of that cunt. There is always so much love when we are together. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to um, share these uh, poems with you all. Um, I like it when uh, two stories come together and clash, right? And really, uh, the act of writing a poem is that, just like a metaphor, when you take one thing on one side and you take another thing, and then they just go like two locomotives and they just go bang in the middle. And really, as poets, we're constantly trying to bring humanity closer together. You say, look at this. You say, look at this. You never thought they were the same. You never thought, yes, they're the same. And that is the shit right there. When that happens and it does really well, you're like, bang. Um, so while I was uh, scrolling on TikTok, where I get all my ideas from, <laughs> I, uh, I came across this story about these, um, this experiment uh, where they put mice in a tank and they put a sweet smell in the tank. And every time they put the sweet smell, they buzzed uh, electricity through the mouse. And they kept on doing this over a time, and finally the mouse struggles and dies. But in that time, the mouse gives birth, and uh, they take the other mouse, and they put it in another tank. And they only put the smell in the tank, and the uh, mouse is like affected by the smell. And it's like about how uh, through ancestry, we carry traumas with us. And I was really interested by that. So um, I clashed that together with an Einstein theory. <laughs> Einstein said, the total amount of energy in existence has always been the total amount of energy in existence. That is to say, some words I'd rather not repeat stick in the hinges cajoled like bunting after a hurricane. That is to ask the question, does all that energy go somewhere? We'll be back after this short message. Somewhere in America, scientists waft perfume in a tank, an aroma similar to almonds and cherries. Watch closely as an electric current shoots through a rodent's leg. Every time it breathes that scent, it feels the jolt pulse bones knock so it jumps like it is remembering a world without cherries and almonds and torture. And slowly, the scent becomes the current, becomes a terror, guttural, packing a rodent into a tiny ball in the corner of the tank. I can't get it out. Sat here, the same seat, the same 472 bus, just in front of another white woman, no relation at all, who doesn't say something I'd rather not repeat, but I recoil. Jut spikes from the bubbles of my spine, my daughter beside me, blowing hot air onto the window, fingering tiny tally marks just to watch them disappear. Apparently, the rodent would bash its face against the tank until the pulse was too much to handle. Wait, there's more. A generation on, the rodent's grandson in a different tank, completely unaware of the suffering of its forefathers, woken, terrified at the scent of almonds and cherries. My daughter is asking me why we got off the bus early. Brilliant. I think I'm just going to do one more. Is that right? Are you old enough for one or two? Two. Great. Um, yeah, I, I, I had another book. I've had a little bit of a manic uh, night, and I still don't know where my cash card is. <laughs> that old chestnut. Um, but I had another book, and it was, in the, it was in the hotel. And I really wanted to read this poem, which I haven't read that much. Um, my partner's father was like, 
he was a really nice guy and they're in like a women's household so coming into that house was hard at the beginning and uh, this guy was just like the most welcoming guy and he's really special to me and then he sort of got diagnosed with cancer he didn't sort of he was diagnosed with cancer and um, he asked me before he died to write this poem and um, so I wrote the poem and then um, I didn't get to read it to him and just as I was doing my final edits we got a call so I wanted to share that with you today tulips I can hear her in the kitchen talking on the phone the way a daughter only talks to her father a voice soft at the seams familiar woven with history like fossils uncovered along the Northumberland coast they discuss important things like vinyl flooring or shelves or how they will plant tulips this winter though he knows he'll probably never see them bloom that night, in bed, she cannot stop crying. In knee pads and old car keys weeks later, soil-soaked hands clamber in bushes, bury green-fingered secrets at the base of a great oak, planting tulips as he teaches, and I catch her behind his watering can for a second, staring as a daughter only stares at her father like he is the sky and she is the boat below it. That night, she asked me, who's going to tell me it'll be all right? It's Saturday, strictly night, and he is stretched out, sipping chocolate mousse, batting tales of Nigeria to his daughter who reaches for his stories like feathers from a falling bird. He laughs and she wipes mousse from his shirt, exchanging a glance from when she was nine with a grazed knee, hobbling to a man who could make the ground say it was sorry. I hope so, he says as the credits roll. I would love to see them grow. It's a year since he passed, spring in our tiny flat. As she is consoling our heartbroken neighbor, the neighbor sobbing into her shoulder and she listens her forehead crinkled crash mat, nodding, speaking with tender voice as though each word a bird nursed released from her mouth. The rain outside is falling, our neighbor shakes his head like I am shaking mine, wondering, where does all that kindness come from? And there, on the balcony, tulips, tall as I have ever seen. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been an absolute pleasure. RG Manuel Pelé, one more time, please. It's a difficult thing to come back on stage when the entire front row are in tears. It's just weird. Like, it's, it's, it's amazing, and I, I, I think, just remember, there are no bad emotions, only weird ways of processing them. So if you process them by crying, you fucking go for it. Laughing, heckling me, that's fine too. I have three pieces of information to give you before we go into our first break and you can all emotionally, um, uh, in terms of uh, alcohol and cigarettes, recuperate. Um, so here are my three pieces of information. The first is that we have books on sale from both Kate Fox and RG. Um, they are at the Book Hive, which will be out in the bar. Um, both Kate and RG are very willing to sign books as well. Um, go and find them. It'll be really good. They take card. Joe, you take card. They take card. Um, so that's the first bit of information. There are also books by Joelle Taylor. I promise you, if you don't get them now, they'll be gone by the end of the night. I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll put that there now, okay? So get them now. She will also sign them for you. Uh, second piece of information. Um, we are having a thing that we are now calling Open Mic March. We've never done an open mic before, but on the 23rd of March, which is a Wednesday, we're going to be here and we're going to be doing an open mic along with two phenomenal headliners, Laurie Bolger and Keith Jarrett. So, Joelle approves. Um, uh, so, 
come along to that. If you write poetry, if you're interested, there'll be some slots available. They'll open on Friday. Keep uh, 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 Our social media will... I don't really do that anymore. So, like, the social media will tell you about it. Um, but, yeah, so we're at Toast Poetry on Twitter, at Toast Poetry UK on Instagram. Find us there. We're also, I think, on Facebook. Not been there in years. Um... So that's the second piece of information, Open Mic March. Also, if you happen to live in Kings Lynn, we're doing a gig in Kings Lynn on the 13th or 12th of March? 12th, 12th of March, which is a Saturday. Uh, we'll be at the workshop in Kings Lynn. It's in the uh, Vancouver Quarter. Uh, we've got Mark Grist and Perona Kumar headlining. That will be really good. Third thing to tell you is, it's been Valentine's Day, right? Some of you are poets. I hope most of you aren't, okay? Because honestly, too many poets in a room, it's weird. Um, it's a lot of emotions. Um, but for 15 minutes over the interval, we'd like to give you the opportunity to become one, okay? We've got some pieces of paper and some pens here. We are setting you the task of writing us a love poem, okay? The only rule is that it's got to start, roses are red, right? That's the only rule. Other than that, you can say roses are red and I've got a thing for monks. That's cool too, right? I often wonder, are monks on Twitter? Nuns are on Twitter. I sometimes think of monks are as well. So yeah, the best one, uh, so come down there, pop, once you've written them, pop them in the red box. We'll then go through them and um, I'll read out a few and you'll get to vote on the best ones. The best one wins two free tickets to our next host show. Sound good? Amazing, cool. One more time for all of the acts of the first half. And now, on your way, go to the bar, go have a cigarette, buy some books.
So much of the preparation for this is deciding my walk-on music. Like, <laughs> I think I'm fucking Anthony Joshua up here. I'm absolutely certain. Okay, how was your break? Broadly fine, thank you. Um, okay, I have been given some poems. I'm very excited. I've not seen these yet. These were um, decided by um, a um, esteemed panel of judges. There was no bribery involved. Everybody was great. And um, as we said, the prize is two tickets to the next um, Toast Poetry Show. Also, you get half of um, Joelle Taylor's winnings for the T.S. Eliot Prize. So that's really exciting too. <laughs> 25 grand worth of poems, right? 26 and a half grand's worth of poems. <laughs> Fuck yeah! I have this image, I have this image of myself later in life when I'm as esteemed as wonderful as you. This is Joel Taylor, by the way, give her a round of applause. Um, I've got this idea of, you know, you know um, when you can afford one of those, um, is it pronounced houses? Houses. When I can afford a house, right, I'm going to introduce, I'm, and I'm going to do it by winning some shit like that. And um, I'm going to walk in, and I'm going to invite people around, and I'm going to gesture, and I'm going to go, this is the house poetry built. And then leave them to, to stare at my one-bedroom studio apartment in, <laughs> in North Norwich. Okay, so let's see what budding poets we have in the audience. Reminders that we have our, what do we call it? Open Mic March, um, 23rd of March here. It's Wednesday. If you want to sign up, keep an eye on our socials. So here's our first poem. These are, I think, all anonymous, so you'll have to own up to them at some point. Roses are red. Blood is red too, but it's mostly blue when it's inside of you. Anatomically correct, morally dubious. Cool, thank you very much. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to hear them and then we're going to whittle it down to two. So let's just hear them, give it a fair judging process. Roses are red, violets are blue, flowers are expensive, will a pot noodle do? What flavour? Because, like, the Bombay bad boy, maybe. It's got to be a Bombay bad boy. Cool, great. The director of the Norwich Arts Centre reckons a Bombay bad boy. <laughs> okay. I sort of want to, I, like, um, I want to give these in. So our funders, we have many wonderful funders. We have the Norwich Arts Centre. We have the Young Norfolk Arts Trust. We've got the National Centre for Writing. Um, we also have the Arts Council England. And I sometimes want to, like, scan these in and send them to the Arts Council as feedback and be like, look. People participated. I can show you our ticket sales too, but really this is the important shit. Okay, roses are red, violets are blue. There was a guy standing beside me at the urinal texting. I don't know why. I don't know why, but I thought of you. Oh, you got a good editing tip. Cut the poem off at its, yeah, its knees, right? If you think a poem is too long, take away the last two lines. It's always better. Great. Okay, cool. Um, I think it's just lovely. Roses are red, white, yellow, and pink. I mostly overthink, except when I'm with you. You're not Argy. You're not allowed to make anyone fucking cry. Cool, final one. Roses are red, violets are red. Everything's red! Should I call an ambulance? And then it goes into a sort of play. Person one. No, that sounds like more of a one, one, one thing. Person two. Are you sure this feels like a hospital thing? Would you stop being a drama queen? My granddad had red eyes for ages and he lived into his 90s. I believe that was a side effect of a 60 year smoking habit. He was also an excessive drinker, maybe an alcoholic. I love our date nights. <laughs> okay, anatomically correct, I'm afraid you're out. This is based entirely on my judgment. Pot noodle, good try, really good try. And if you come and find me afterwards, I will buy you a pot noodle as, as like recompense for not giving you any free tickets. Um, so we've got these three, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have to go by, by applause. So, who wants red date nights? Round of applause, who wants that to win? Okay. 
Who wants um, Roses Are Red and Overthinking? Oh, I think that's in the lead. And who wants um, Creepy Guy at the Urinal? I think, I think it's a clear winner. Who would like to own up to looking at other people at the urinal? Hands up. I can't, I can't see you. Is it you? Is it really you? I'm really sorry, mate. We actually gave you a, we actually, so we actually gave you a free ticket already. So at, at, actually the winner of that was the director of the Norwich Arts Centre. Um, and I'm not, be, I'm not being funny. I, yeah, I did sort of let him in for free this time. Another way of putting that is that he gave us a two grand for, for a ticket. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. Um, Pasco, I'm not giving you a free ticket. I don't want a free ticket. Um, so, instead, we now have to choose. Red date. Red, uh, round of applause for red date. <laughs> round of applause for overthinking. I'm really sorry, overthinking. I love you. I really fucking do. And I'm one of you too. But, Roses are Red, who are you? Put your hand up. At the back, hey man, what's your name? Brandon, excellent. I love a man who's named after a small town in Suffolk. There is nothing better than that. Brandon, what I need you to do is talk to the lovely person next to you who's in pink jeans. Give them your name and that will be on the door at our March event. So you can come along totally for free, bring a pal with you, a date, hopefully. If they still live. Way. Okay. Let's get us in the swing. So we've got two more acts for you, but I'm just going to do a poem to get us back in. So we're out of our, our loviness. Um, so... Um, my football team, I play on a football team, we've been playing together since September. Um, last Tuesday, we won our first game. <laughs> Fuck yes. Um, I'm fairly certain, so like they're quite, I, I don't really know many people on that team before I joined. And I, it's quite difficult learning people's names when you're playing football. I'm fairly certain, I might be wrong, but I think all of them are called Matt. <laughs> Matt Aria. I play in a football team of mats, a trifecta of mats, a sympathy of mats, and I am an archaeologist searching for the original architects of mat. Yoga mats, stretching by the corner flags, welcome mats who are the nicest guys you'll ever meet, bathroom mats who massage wet feet, wrestling mats who throw their weight around, place mats who don't make a sound, but you don't notice until they're gone, sleeping mats who go wild camping on the weekends and drive minivans who are having naps on, on the sub bench next to mats in beanie hats, tapping in for a Tuesday night football match, mat substitutes for mat. Of course, here, they are all surname to surname to surname to surname to surname, so we know one from the other, so they don't blur like a badly taken picture. These mats are so similar, and yet so peculiar from each other. One is ponytail and tattoo. The other one is just number two all over, please, at the barbers. The third is bald and sensitive to sunburn. All are husbands, running their lungs out of an evening, and just this once, we win. A matte finish shines, no matter what the dull painted sideline says. I'm so glad you got that one. <laughs> one mat wins man of the match, but we must remember that all mats matter. Clatter down stairwells and through pubs, row upon row upon row of mats. How do we know one mat from another? Am I one too? Despite being Lewis all my life, am I also somehow mat? The word mat comes from mate which comes from meat, as in the food you eat when you're with friends. Companion comes from the French pan, the bread you break with friends, or the pain you feel when they leave. Mat, mate, meat, lost in the heat of the moment. All these mats are heartful and beautiful, so loving, that after our first win, I ask if they want to go to the pub, and they say no, smiling. They want to get home and tell their wives. Uh, next up, we have a poet who is currently completing his master's at the esteemed University of East Anglia. And, woo! 
everyone, in, half the people in Norwich went there. It's not that big a deal anymore. <gasps> Come on. Half the people here teach there. Um, hi, guys. Thanks for that master's degree. Got it for free. Um, uh, yeah, so he's currently co completing his master's, and I saw him at an open mic night, and I just thought that his poems are like a knife, and you, you're like, oh, they're dangerous, and they, they could, like, they, they, they are about violence and stuff, but then meeting him, they're like a knife cutting through a really lovely tomato. And I was just like, oh, mate, these are gorgeous, and you're wonderful. So I want to put your hands together. We're going to start with Simon and Anne, and you are going to clap through the audience for the one and only Oliver Schroeder! I'm not sure how close I need to be to this. I'm, I'm incredibly honored to be here, actually. I've, there are three incredibly brilliant acts I have to follow, and one incredibly brilliant act I have to proceed. So, what about me, Oliver? <laughs> <laughs> four brilliant acts I have to follow. So I usually write about gender. This poem is also about gender. It's called, I first knew what made me a boy the year Avatar came out. <laughs> I first knew what made me a boy the year Avatar came out when they, the girls, were ordered out of our classroom into the hall, and we, the boys, were left inside, and Miss Carter brought out 15 worksheets for each of us, on which were dotted outlines of each of us. And we were told, draw on the person everything that makes you a boy. And the classroom got to work like they had been asked the easiest question. And laughing, they all drew their favorite features they had and hoped to have, three long hairs sprouting from each armpit, a mustache like our brothers, our fathers, and a variety of squashes shaping out of each groin. The more time we had, the more creative we got. And my friend drew a West Ham United shirt on his, bo on his boy with cleated boots, and another boy drew only shirt shorts. Dad doesn't wear a shirt. He wore a beard up to his circular eyes instead. They scribbled out half the hairlines, and I saw two toupees reappear. They sent snakes and roses up their arms and doubled each bicep. Each stomach bulged with the weight of boy and beer. Each page bulged, and I couldn't believe the knowledge everyone already had. How everyone already knew what and how they wanted to be. When I handed in my dotted sheet, marked only by the word boy inside the upper margin, Miss Carter screamed, take this seriously. But I wrote all the boy I had. And when she screamed, I could feel something crawling under my skin. And I thought, maybe that is the boy. That itch in the margin. Thank you. Cool. Oliver Schrouder. Okay, here we go. Fucking ready for this. It's been 10 years in the making. I met Joelle Taylor. Um, yeah, probably 10, 11 years ago. Um, because I knocked on a door call, um, of um, a cafe in, in Covent Garden and she answered it and invited me in to write some poems. Um, it was less weird than that, I promise you. Anyway, so she saw me perform. And it was really nice. And then she, um, she said, oh, mate, I've got this gig coming up. Got this gig coming up, and um, it's a gig with uh, the band The Beat, and I'm I'm introducing The Beat, right? A few people in the Tears of a Clown, yeah, we remember The Beat, right? And um, uh, and she said, but they've got a support act, and I need someone to introduce them, and I can't find anyone who'll say the band's name. <laughs> and she was like, I reckon you would. So I was like, what's the band called? A hundred percent tit burster and the cockbuster. <laughs> Turns out, three very polite German women. <laughs> so I was like, can I, so I like went up to them. I was like, can I just get it right? So it's it's a hundred percent tit and the cockbuster, and they were like, no, actually, it's the um hundred percent cock and the tit burster. <laughs> Danke. And then they just did some thrash metal. So I was on a boat in Canary Wharf, hanging out with Joelle, and then I texted Joelle at the end of the night, and I was like, where are you? And she just texted me back saying, doing nefarious things in a cabin. <laughs> and so now, 
<laughs> now, but genuinely, on, on a serious note, there is, there are very few poets in the world, probably, but in the UK, in my experience of it, who have done as much as Joel has done, not just for poetry and not just for young people, but for our community as a whole. Not just our community, other communities, queer communities. It means so much to have her here, more than anything else, because we won't be able to afford her anymore. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask you because I feel like we've already got the energy in the room. We are going to host, we are going to welcome to the stage the author of Kanto and Othered Poems that has just won the T.S. Eliot Prize, 26 and a half grand's worth of poems. Ladies and gentlemen, Joel Taylor! Hello. <laughs> Oh my God, I've had such a good night tonight. I was, um, what, stunning poets. Um, is it Oliver? Fucking hell, bro. That's amazing. Absolutely stunning. All, uh, and uh, and um, the first floor spot as well. What was your name? Perla. Perla. Stunning. Oh, hi. Amazing. Um, yeah, so thanks so much um, for inviting me here. It's an absolute privilege and honour to be in such a beautiful space and certainly working with somebody years and years ago like Lewis to come to a venue like this and see this. What Lewis and Daisy have created together is a, is a very moving thing to experience. So thank you so much for inviting me to be part of it. So yeah, I wrote a book. It's called Canto. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's been wicked. Um, being on the BBC, talking about that. <laughs> they call it C plus NTO. And at first I was like, what? <laughs> but just to remind you all, Kanto is a real word. And it means to narrate, tell or recount a story. Third person, singular, past, historic. And I discovered that a few months after I'd submitted the book. So... <laughs> <clears throat> People were like, it's crass. I was like, it's a word. <laughs> it's a language, bruv. Yeah. Um, so this book, this book um, came from a very personal space. I just want to take you back in time a little bit. I'm 54 years old. I came out at the age of 12, but back in those days, you didn't actually come out. You were kind of dragged out, beaten, and then uh, you ran back inside as quickly as you could. So coming, the, in fact, the, the, the most important word in coming out was out. That's what it meant. So I lost my family. I mean, I, I didn't leave at 12, because that would be a diff... I might start saying that, though, because it sounds better. I left home at 12. <laughs> it's very sad. Um, <clears throat> but I did leave home as soon as I hit 16, like many gay people did in the 70s and 80s. So about 1983, I skipped off and went to Greenham Common, like a lot of dykes did back in the day. Um, it's basically, you know, it was a, a site to, um, we were working, protesting against the American invasion. Well, it wasn't an invasion, it's a bit dramatic. Um, <laughs> but it was the putting of cruise missiles onto British land. But it, essentially, we can talk about this for a long, long time, but basically it was, it was dyke porn. It was um, nine miles perimeter of leather. <laughs> With cruise missiles, you get, no, nothing. nothing. <laughs> It wasn't like that at all, it was very wrong. Um, what I, was, I don't know why I'm rambling. But just to try and impress upon you the very great difference between then and now, and I wanted to write into this time because um, I wanted to honor some of my very good friends who are no longer here. And I wanted to also talk about lesbians or dykes or whatever you want to call us, um, and particular within that, the butch community. You might call us boys, B-O-I-S. You wouldn't call me a boy now because that would be a bit creepy. But anybody younger, a young butch is a boy, a black butch is a stud, and there are other variations, but most of us don't know about this. So this book is about that, but not really, because it's about love, and it's about community and friendship and protest. And obviously, it's written into a period of history where our community is under the biggest threat that I've ever seen in my lifetime. Because we're not only fighting amongst ourselves, but we are not noticing the huge threat 
that is approaching us. Um, and we can talk about that afterwards in the bar if anyone's got any poppers. We can, um, <laughs> I can go through it. <laughs> Cheers, bro. <laughs> So, I've only got 20 minutes, so I'll get on with it. The, the conceit of this book is that a series of vitrines, and a vitrine is like a museum cabinet display case. They start to appear all over the UK, but in particular around London, in all the old lesbian spaces. There used to be about 226 during my day. There's one now, and believe me, lesbians don't go there. It's like a really freaky bar. Um, <coughs> These vitrines contain things like a museum of first kisses, your first fuck. That night in 1986 under the snooker table in Manchester University, for example. Um, <laughs> the bombing of the Admiral Duncan, a march. It's all the very, very important moments um, that are autobiographical, but also kind of meaningful to the wider LGBT community, particularly the, the L's. Um, so I'm going to read bits of that. Um, and the first thing I'm going to read is, uh, I'm going to go into one of the vitrines tonight, and it's a vitrine that contains an entire bar called the Maryville Bar. And the Maryville is a kind of amalgamation of all the dirty oasis that I spent my beardless youth in. Um, and back in the day, historical term, back in the day, uh, it was different. You were kind of, you were met by butchers during the, um, going into the bar. So Gateways was very well known for that. A lot of my friends now were bouncers or bar staff at Gateways, very famous bar. Um, and it was very common that when you walked into a space that you were welcomed then. The reason you were welcomed is that on the outside, literally everybody hated you. Like you would not tell your best friend you were a lesbian. You fucking wouldn't. You absolutely, would, unless they would get off with you, then obviously <laughs> it would come out. But <laughs> generally speaking, you did not talk about it and you left your families and you were ugly. And everybody talked about how ugly you were all the time, but no matter what they say, the ugliness was inside you. You felt it. And then what happened? You see, imagine this book is a door, because books are doors. Imagine this book is a door, and this is the door to the Maryville, and it's got that much space between belonging and not belonging in your own body. That much space between ugly and handsome. So we'll go into the Maryville straight away. Some of the poems in the book are written as stage directions, which has confused people. Scene one, exterior, night, a main road in London, LX1, street lights watch a woman pass and text each other, FX1, the sound of a door opening into a chest cavity, a lone woman walks briskly, head down and holding invisible bouquets, ahead of her is a hunched building with its hands in its pockets, bracketed by gossiping fairy lights. LX2. A neon sign flashes its pink dilate. Maryville, the sign says. The woman pushes open the door and enters her own body. At the bar, she orders a drink, and when it arrives, it is her breath. Music is playing. It's the sound of someone being listened to. She notices that she's sitting at every table. So when the woman asks her to dance, the whole of the past stands up to dance with her her classmates, her teachers, the man manager of the shop she worked in over Christmas, the newspaper proprietor, the street she grew up on, an adjacent town, her parents and grandparents, the kid who waited for her after school. The song ends, the world opens, Venus 
rises. Obviously, I have to do a kind of... I just got ice in my mouth. I just... <laughs> I have to do a very truncated version. Um, yeah. So, do you know what I meant by Venus Rises? Who knew what I meant by that? Okay, by the book. Excellent. Inside the Maryville Bar, there are four butchers. These are are real women, um, are based, are very close friends of mine, and like I said, a big inspiration for the book was my rage at the death of my friends, the butch women, and how nobody gave a fuck, and how they are killed, and how, or how they die. Um, so I created these characters, they are real people, and if you're a little bit older and want to know who they are, we can talk about that. The first one is called Valentine, and Valentine is this kind of um, a black stud, uh, what we used to call SM, but it's now BDSM, a leather dyke, basically. I was a leather dyke. Leather dyke. And a very handsome bit of the kind of heartthrob of the book. Valentine. Born, right body, wrong day. Valentine flicks her lighter in the corner of the club and white women flutter. Tonight, she has dressed as the inside of her mouth, a hand-sewn suit excised from a cured night sky black. Leather has its own skincare routine. It listens to its mother. I've heard it said. Some girls give birth to themselves on the backs of motorbikes. Invent the wind, let the road uncurl from between their legs, the infinite motorway, something British and unbidden. I know why we're drawn to the corners. It's where the road cannot reach us. Every part of a woman is a weapon if you know how to hold her, Valentine says. The corner flicks a morse, and in the dark, white hearts beat like moths against a headlight. Thank you. Do you know you keep making the poetry sound, which is actually a sex sound for me as well? So you keep... <laughs> Easy. Like, <clears throat> there you go. Hmm. which is <laughs> the kind of sound I hear during sex quite a lot. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, so this is um, the youngest of the butchers. The name is Angel. And Angel was, like most of us, um, dealing with generational trauma, dealing with child sexual abuse, and it makes you angry. It makes you very, very angry. So Angel, within the book kind of holds the violence and thinks about violence and tenderness and, and the violence of women and what it means to us. Angel. When Angel looks in the mirror, it looks away first. Star fist, open jaw, how the shine becomes you, clean friend. Taller, then yesterday, spine an unravelling plot you, odd insistence, marking of the blue tattoo, eyebrow pinned Prince Butterfly. When you walked in the room, it became you. How you brought the silence in with you, how you brought the night to its knees, back there where the quiet ones go, and now, the night won't stop texting. How many times have we walked home, you and I, only to find home walking softly behind us? I have seen you leap over language to push a man back inside himself, throw pint glasses like seeds, speak to every woman as though she were your mother I have seen. Your fists sob. At the center 
of every boy is a bare room. And inside a swinging light bulb, a wire thin girl dances, stays with you, even when you look away. Angels don't fall from heaven. They leave at closing time. Unscrew their fox in the backs of black cabs. Abandon their bodies beneath a girl, beneath a duvet, beneath the wet, dilated night on fire. Thank you. Thanks very much. I noticed there wasn't any hmm, in that last one. A little bit disappointed by that. Could we have a little? Hmm? That's how Hitler got in. Just don't do pink. No. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So, anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes. All right, so um, the main thing I wanted to do tonight, if it's okay with you, is do the, the piece that, um, that sparked the whole book. And I was asked by Apples and Snakes um, for their 35-year anniversary. You know, Apples and Snakes are a big poetry performance agency, and they're doing this massive interactive show. And they commissioned five poets to write around the theme of protest. And um, I started, you know, you start in that kind of, you know, this is my poem about protest. And then I just went, I'm fucking so, I'm so, so tired. I'm so tired of this shit. I'm so tired of reading what you have to say about women like me. I'm so tired of the abuse of the LGBTQ community, plus whatever, all of us, you know, and I think it's time you went to your fucking rooms, to be honest. I had a little think about what you're doing. So this poem is, um, is for us, and it might not be that you identify as butch or trans mask or non-binary, it doesn't matter. I just ask you that you identify as, as alive and important. This is called Kanto. And inside the vitrine, if you can imagine, there's a, a boxing ring roped off in barbed wire and a 50-year-old woman in a pair of boxer shorts, it's not good looking, um, and a three-piece suit getting dressed throughout it. Some girls fall from sun-lit skies straight down into flat, pack, floral dresses, grab their smiles from a hook behind the door, rescue their faces from riptides of mirrors. Some girls are always falling. Round one, the body as battleground. You fall and miss your body entirely. Land somewhere in enemy territory behind the lines. Your body, a foreign country you cannot get a visa for. Your skin, a parachute caught in tree branches. You awaken in no man's land. Gunfire. From over the horizon, and women are crucified on hashtags across the dark hills. Your trench is crowded with dead women, wearing faces that try to escape them and the clothes of someone you once knew. There are landmines buried deep beneath your skin, and no understands them. In between the battle cry and the bedroom is this sticky quiet, this no man's land, and this is where you live. Men explode when you least expect it. All these lifetimes searching for body. Round two, the body as protest. 
Born backward, bright back and wide skin, rolling cigarettes and shirt sleeves, skyline chin. Levi 501's curled up to cough, lip the same white t-shirt so they can project themselves on you, tsunami quiff, and black boots whose roots spread and tangle through the centre of the earth. You don't wear makeup. To prove you have not made anything up, this is your face. Your father's friends gave it to you one Christmas Eve, 1973. You unwrapped it beneath a decorated tree from which the rest of your family hung. They sipped cocktails. As you slowly disappeared, swaying gently to that wail of celebration, that harbinger of party. You cut your first suit from the thick silence when you enter a room. They call you Butch. The name derived from Butch Cassidy, true story. You are the descendant of outlaws, outlaws. You are irony incarnate, woman butchered, cut into select meets middle distance, stare, shoulder, wild tongue. They fear you. Boy, bois, dyke, diesel female sodomite, lady Faggot, bull dyke, bull dagger, queer, pervert, gold star, silverback, stud, invert, kiki, she male, drag drone, baby butch, tomboy, stone. But if you are a stone, you are a chip off the mountain, and you join an avalanche of wrong walking women, shaven heads like tumbling rocks. You keep them close, they are. Rosary. On the dance floor, we are tidal. Heckle the night, passing nods between us and handshakes that stop our handshaking. We are untamed, a wilderness of women. We are waste ground, what a waste love. Nothing grows on us, barren and sterile and unuseful female, empty as church pews. The wind rattles its fists inside our wounds. Come on then, snake boy. Come on then, heretic healer. Where are the maths that solve us? How do we fit into your algae bra, your Binary code, our bodies are political placards. And we dance as demonstration that you do not own us. It is revolution in the living room, uprising in the public toilets, insurgency in the suburbs. Fear is a girl backing into her face. Is it? Not camp enough to be a best friend, bruv. Our closets a strata of fossilized clothes go pelt. Is it not funny enough for your talk show, bruv? Is it a woman without makeup? Is a woman without a face? Who knew that when we were cleansing, we were erasing? Our whole egg existence. Round three. The body as trespass. Dyke. You are a trespasser in your own body. The landowners are men who pass by you in the street. In Accrington, cars stammer and words ejaculate from half-open windows. Your mother's phone rings in the middle of the night. Shh, do you know about, shh, 
Do you know about three Pentecosts with Nazi insignia break into your home? God is an atheist who no longer believes in himself. They unscrew the light bulb slowly, eyes fixed on the unmade up girl, trembling defiance. They whisper a prayer for you to leave your family. You do. Thirteen. And a man pulls you over the back seat of a bus and stubs his kiss out on your cheek. Slowly, a boxer's embrace, but he doesn't throw the punch. He posts it. You wait by letterboxes, flinch when it chatters, never answer the phone. In Brixton, men cradle their fists like babies and watch as you walk past as though they are thin, ribbed cats in the undergrowth. And you, a small, shaven-headed bird, there's a reason that women are compared to birds and it's got fuck all to do with wings. Some songs harden on the wind. Some girls are kept in gilded cages on suburban mantelpieces. 18, out, clubbing with the crew, a baby butch in the abattoir of beauty, the quiver and frantic white girls with bindies, white boys with dreadlocks, oh God. Saris and docks, tribal tattoos, we are the modern primitives, wearing our heritage like white flags, like cowardice, and you dance as though you are stamping out flames, as though your boots are hammering in the last nails to the coffin of the old gods. Strangers hug and tell each other secrets, you are ecstatic. But then the light looks away. Skinny wolves separate you from the flocked wallpaper, the drugs no longer working as they amber, I you you, aberration, and they must conquer what they cannot name. 23, and you finish rehearsals in the city with nowhere to sleep. So you wish the posh kids good night. And you walk and you walk and you walk and you walk and he finds you quickly. And when you come round, you are empty and his eyes are full and above you, twin gods. This is the first time you think you're going to be killed. And when you're not, it's a disappointment. The morning after pill is a communion wafer and you are forgiven your trespasses. You learn quickly. Men are broken things, breaking things. Round four, the body as cemetery. The first Time you die, you drink a bottle of cleaning fluid and moths of nurses wrap you in white swaddling curses. Fuck you, they whisper a back alley lullaby. Fuck you, they croon as you're interred in the hospital bed. And when the mourners come, they seem happy. A picnic in a mortuary. The third time you die, it's classic, cinematic, a bottle of your mother's sleeping pills. You swallow them without water, watching a film about a girl who is not loved. The film ends, the cinema empties, but no one notices the thin thing lying there with a mouth like an earthquake in a country no one can spell. They don't find you till morning, and when they do, you are packed off to the high priests of psychiatry to apologize, you lie. And your smile 
is a torn cunt, a split. Round five. The body as back room. Each night, we have a lock-in and meet at the back of my heart, smoking in circles, passing grins between us like pass the parcel, opening each layer of the smile until the pith is revealed. We are ferocious women. Eating our children, our youth, stepping out of our skins and leaving them draped behind us like soiled wedding dresses as we fall into each other's mouths. This is love. Furious love. We die slowly. Cigarettes stubbed against obsidian skies. A brain explodes into night butterflies. A car loses its grip on reality. Suicides by the bouquetful. Not one of my friends was allowed to live in her body unaccompanied. Always a landlord. Always a lodger. Round six, the body as haunted house. In sleep, my body is a haunted house. There are footsteps along fallopian corridors. The corridor is a rope strung across a mouth. I have been woken by blurred voices without bodies, quiet arguments in my basement. Once I was possessed by a small girl who looked the same as me, who so ate herself on a Sunday afternoon while our parents were downstairs, hardwiring their hangovers and Christmas tunes played in nooses. My heart is a church bell and nobody visits. And God is a man with his hands in his pockets, watching. Round seven. The body as uprising. Oh, you bayonet boys, you truncheon rub. My face doesn't fit my face, but your fist does. Years from now, no one will remember how we fought, how each Bruised knuckle was a white boy's head bent in prayer. No one will remember the love, how alike it is to rage, how screams made corporeal are rainbows, or how rainbows became corporate logos, or how we carved our epitaphs into a stone wall. No one will remember unpicking acronyms by candlelight so Fuck it. I'll be in the back bar of heaven. Kaz will be getting a rounding, releasing that laugh, wild birds escaping her mouth. None of this will matter. I'll be riding the ghost roads with Valentine, bare back, knee clenched on a Harley. I'll be scoffing the city with Dudzilly. Men will stare like open shaft mines. I'll be walking the white lines with angel, tight mouth, antelope heart. I can't remember the names of all my dead friends. But they're here now. Our grief, a leather jacket, our laughter, static, 
as we fade to a sepia, the color of blood mixed to water disappearing down a plug hole, much like the meeting of our legs. Remember this, our whole lives are a protest. Thank you very much. Joel Taylor, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a joy. It's been a tear. It's been a smile. It's been all of the above. Um, Thank you to everyone who works at the NAC. Thank you to all our funders. Thank you to my partner in business, crime, and love, Daisy Henwood. Thank you to all of our performers. Uh, let's go through them. Perla, RG, Kate, Oliver, Joelle. Round of applause for them all. I remember, I remember three, like however long ago it was, 10, 12 years ago, Joelle gave me three pieces of advice in a poetry workshop. Um, she said, use concrete detail. <laughs> Be as kind as you possibly can to each other and buy tickets to the next Toast event on the 23rd <laughs> of March featuring Laurie Bolger and Keith Jarrett. I've been Lewis Buxton. Thank you all very much. Good night. <laughs> There are 10 of Joelle's books left in the bar. Go, go, go!